Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining this event presented in the American Inspiration Author Series. It's great to have you with us today in the land of history and fiction, looking at cultural trends and norms in early 20th century America, and particularly the experience of women. I'm Margaret Talcott, Director of Literary Programs at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. On your screen is a schedule for our hour-long event featuring author Anne Leary and her new novel, The Foundling. After a brief talk and sharing of some wonderful historical images, Ms. Leary will be in dialogue with another guest, moderator Alex Green, who will ask his own questions, and he'll also be posing some of yours. Before we get started, some quick introductions and background information. You're in a Zoom webinar format, which means that your microphone is muted and your video is off. We can't take your comments in the chat box, but do look there for relevant information and helpful links. We asked for your questions as you registered. If you have additional queries, enter them into the Q&A box at the bottom right hand of your screen. We'll get to as many of those as we can. A video of today's program will be shared with all of you, anyone who registered for this event. The link will be emailed when it's available in the American Inspiration video archive. You are very welcome to share that link with friends. Of course, the real education, enlightenment, and in the case of this book, enjoyment, it's a novel, um, of course, that comes from reading Anne Leary's new book, The Foundling. There is so much to love about this book. It's insights into history, it's pacing, secrets and secreted people, it's look into mysterious situations, corruption and power. I was completely gripped. Copies of The Foundling can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Mass. Use the code AMINS22 as you order, and the book you receive will be signed by the author. You'll see more information about this in the chat and also in the follow-up email that's coming your way. Now for some introductions. Anne Leary is the New York Times bestselling author of a memoir and four novels, including The Good House. She's written for the New York Times, Plowshares, National Public Radio, and Red Book, among other publications. Her work has been translated into 18 languages and adapted for the Amazon Modern Love television series. Her great success in the last week is that The Foundling has been reviewed favorably coast to coast in the New York Times, the LA Times, Washington Post, Real Simple, People, and many other publications. Our congratulations to you, Anne, on this wonderful book that so many of us are enjoying. Today's moderator, Alex Green, is a leader in the field of disability research and advocacy. He is a writer, scholar, and lecturer at Harvard Kennedy School and has been a fellow at Harvard Law School. Professor Green's work has appeared in the Boston Globe, The Atlantic, and with his students in the New York Times. He has a particularly important piece in today's Boston Globe about eugenics in the state of Massachusetts and current legislation. This is so very timely and how lucky we are to have him with us. Before we meet Professor Green, let's hear from Anne though and see some amazing historical photos. Anne, welcome. It's really wonderful to have you with us. And um, we're all so eager to get started and learning more about your research and cultural norms, families and institutions in the last century. Welcome, welcome and over to you. Margaret, thank you so much. What a wonderful introduction. And so I've been looking forward to this event uh, since I found out I was doing it because uh, I love, uh, I, I, I became interested in my family's ancestry and genealogy about a decade ago. And since then, I've become, uh, I'm, I've become involved in forums or uh, groups online uh, of genealogists and historians, many of whom have helped me very much in my research. So it's very exciting to me today that this, uh, that the audience I know is, is quite knowledgeable about um, genealogy and history, American history in particular. Um, my book, The Foundling is a novel, but it is based on uh, something I discovered uh, about it was about a decade ago when I joined Ancestry.com. I wanted to, like millions of others, because it was a big craze, I wanted to know a few things about my family, but foremost, I wanted to find out why my maternal grandmother was an orphan. I knew she had been an orphan and had grown up 
uh, had spent some of her childhood in an orphanage. And I just wanted to know what happened to her parents. I still don't know the answers to those questions because what I found out uh, took over my life for a decade. And um, so basically, um, uh, I, I researched this book for many years and I then wrote a novel based uh, on what I learned. Uh, that is the novel, The Foundling. It came out last week. And thank you for mentioning how kindly it has been received. Um, but now I'll give you a little backstory on how I came to write the novel, uh, because, uh, it, you know, I, without it, it the, you know, the novel wouldn't exist. And so basically, I went on um, Ancestry and uh, try, I then joined other um, you know, genealogy sites, but I wanted, I, I started searching for my grandmother. I couldn't find her birth certificate. I couldn't find the orphanage she grew up in. I eventually found her. Well, let's start the slides, actually, if we could have a photograph so we could, I can, I think there's photos that will support what I'm about to say coming up. Okay. This is my family. Uh, my grandmother is the one sitting with the glasses on. I'm with the ponytails petting the dog and my mother is sitting before her. Those are my siblings. Uh, I think this was, might've been taken maybe in like 1968 or 69. Um, that was one of the last times I saw my grandmother. Sadly, she lived another, you know, probably 25 years, but um, she and my mother became estranged because she, um, she had some, uh, she had a very traumatic life and it, some psychiatric issues that made it difficult for her to have relationships with other people. But if we can move to the next slide, well, so, but no, actually stay on this for a minute. Because of this, because I, I knew I had met her and I had kind of liked, I had quite admired her. <laughs> I don't know. I thought she was very interesting, especially since I was then denied access to her. And I'm one of, I was born with this insane curiosity and must know things I'm not supposed to know. I was always kind of fascinated by her. So I then uh, loved when I could, you know, it was a, I was able to start researching online. If we can move to the next screen or the next photo, <clears throat> I never, my grandmother's name was Mary Rashmeyer. I couldn't find her, as I said, her birth certificate or any record of her until 1930. This is a census record, the 1930 census record. She was 17 years old, as you can see on your screen, and she was working. I wish I had sent a picture of the top of that because it, it had the name of the place where she worked. It was called, according to the census record, the Laurelton State Village for Feeble-Minded Women. That was all they could fit on the top of this page and the many pages following this was a very large institution. It was actually called the Laurelton State Village for Feeble-Minded Women of Childbearing Age. They just couldn't fit that on the uh, top of the census record. Um, I was quite uh, kind of like taken aback by what I thought was a very rude or in, in, uh, you know offensive name, the word feeble-minded. Uh, it turned out, I soon learned that in the early 20th century, the word feeble-minded, as well as the words idiot, imbecile, and moron were clinical terms used to describe people with intellectual disabilities. Idiot uh, referred to the people with uh, the lowest IQs, imbecile, you know, medium, and then moron was people who are very highly functioning. Um, it was actually a term uh, that was uh, coined early in the 20th century, and it meant it had to do with moral uh, feeble-mindedness or what they called a, a person being morally defective, and that plays very much into uh, the asylum where my grandmother works. So the Laurelton's, it turned out that the word feeble-minded wasn't the most offensive um, part of the title, a very long title of the institution where my grandmother worked. It was the of childbearing age part because Laurelton State Village then, uh, it was founded, it changed later, but at that time it was a eugenics asylum, one of many in this country. If you don't know what eugenics is or was, you're not alone. It's not something we were taught about in the United States, in public schools. I've been doing events all week since my book came out last week. And I always ask people if they raise your hand if you know what eugenics is. And a lot of us, a lot of people didn't. I didn't really know it. I had heard the term. I didn't really know what it meant. But in the 1920s, eugenics was a household word. And that's that. That's very important to know because, um, you know, a lot of people 
uh, wonder why a person like my grandmother would work at a place like this. They did because these places were celebrated. They were considered important. Eugenics was considered a very progressive, uh, it was considered a science and uh, it was embraced. It was, uh, you know, embraced by people we all admire. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, 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 authors, uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, uh, and many industrialists, of course, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, I can never remember the first name of Kellogg, but Kellogg of the Serial Fortune was a very, uh, you know, very uh, avid eugenicist. Margaret Sanger, many know now, uh, was also a uh, very, uh, very uh, proponent of eugenics. Eugenics, simply put, was a philosophy that was easy for people to understand because it was basically this idea that um, we can make the world or we could make our country or our community better if we actually have the best people in the community have more children and the people who have issues such as uh, intellectual disabilities, other disabilities, blindness, deafness, or are one of what was considered then, not in dog whistle terms, but blatantly in newspaper articles, um, books, uh, people of inferior races, people who were not um, you know, from Northern or Western Europe where our earliest uh, immigrants came. <laughs> they called those people the, the, the original Americans, of course they were not. So anyway, that's simply, that would, positive eugenics would be just simply that. Why not encourage some, you know, really well-educated people to have more children and people who aren't, you know, very, you know, and poor people maybe should have less. But America, especially other countries were also exploring eugenics. Uh, the United States is really quickly moved to negative eugenics, which was actually prohibiting uh, people who were considered inferior uh, or abnormal or defective was a, a word used quite a bit, uh, mentally or morally defective, uh, was prohibiting them from conceiving children. Uh, many people who know about eugenics are aware of you, uh, forced sterilization of people who were considered, uh, they might've been criminal, they might've been, um, they might've had psychiatric issues or been diagnosed as being feeble-minded. Um, many states didn't, uh, they prohibited forced uh, sterilization. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania was one of them. So what if, what they did instead was they said they imprisoned um, people who were uh, considered uh, feeble-minded. We can go to the next, side, I think, because I I don't want to look at this. <laughs> okay. So here's a picture. This is a, a photograph I found in the uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania State Archives. I found many photographs. This was later than when my grandmother was there. But these this shows women. And this was these were promotional kind of um not propaganda, but they wanted to show the institution in a really good light. So the, this was I think the the um kind of the 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 subtitle or the caption of this was girls getting vocational training. Girls was how they, the, all the residents were called inmates and they were all called girls no matter their age. So I'm gonna use words that you're gonna find offensive, but I have to because they were the words used then and it'll be too confusing if I keep saying, well, you know. So the girls here in this picture, um, are you know learn there if you were if you were looking at a brochure with this picture you'd think you would be told they were learning a, a trade that might help them someday if they were to be released again this is a later uh photograph when my grandmother was there if you were once you were uh sent to Laurelton State Village for feeble-minded women of childbearing age you didn't leave until you were no longer of childbearing age uh, there were girls there as young as 12 and 13 years old. They would leave when they reached menopause because they weren't sent there to have this wonderful training that you're watching here. Um, this was actually people just doing the work of the asylum, um, but they were sent there just to keep them from having children. Um, can we see? I forget what the next slide is. This is I've never done a talk yet. Oh, so okay. So this is Laurelton State Village. This now I went there um, several times to see it after I found out about it, and I visited the area several times. I want to say right now that many people 
many asylums in general were in rural parts of this country. And some of them were very beautiful, like Laurelton State Village. And it also employed quite a lot of people in the area. My grandmother worked there and I know she was she would have considered herself very lucky to work there. And um, so people in the community, what happened was Laurelton State Village, eventually there were reforms and it turned into a much better place than it was when my grandmother worked there. And they, I just wanna say there are still people alive who work there and I wanna, um, and I've met them and talked to some and have really helped, some, they've supplied me with some invaluable information. So um, I just wanted to say, you know, say that the, you know, it it, it didn't end up. It, it it was it was a better place eventually. But this is what it looked like. This is as close as I could ever get to it because it closed in the 1990s, as many asylums did. And our uh, moderator and guest and my new favorite person, Alex Green, will explain. He's he he knows a lot about. Um, the history of uh, asylums and um, and and the kind of evolution of what types of people were uh, were committed to them. I will just say that in my mother in my grandmother's day, uh, the late uh, 1920s and early 1930s and, and prior to that, uh, how would you what what would cause a young woman to be sent to Laurelton State Village and I keep. I want. I don't want to get away from my novel. My novel is set at a, an asylum like this. It's called Nettleton State Village. It's very much the same. And my novel, it's set there. Um, but basic. So it's in the novel and in, in real life. If you were, um, if you were uh, arrested for prostitution or drinking, which was illegal in the twenties, if you, uh, if your husband was tired of you, and uh, he could say you were slow in the head, if you were 13 and said your uncle was touching you inappropriately and he was a prominent member of the community. There are many reasons you would be called feeble-minded. In my novel, um, the, the quick story of my novel is it's about two girls who grew up together in an orphan asylum as they were called in those days. And they meet again years later at an asylum like this, but now they're no longer roommates. Mary, based on my grandmother, is working there as a secretary to the very dynamic female doctor who runs the place. Lillian is an inmate. Uh, she's being held there against her will. She was diagnosed as being feeble-minded for having a child of mixed race. Lillian is white and the child's father was her uh, black boyfriend who she was very much in love with. Uh, um, so that in those days would be considered uh, you know, in, in her 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 choosing that person to be her lover, to have premarital sex, many things, uh, several things in just that would have qualified her as a person who was feeble minded. Um, I'll also add that um, I loved this booklet I found that was written by a doctor who worked at this asylum that you're looking at right now. Um, she she was writing about uh, you know working with feeble-minded women, and it was written in the 1920s, and uh, the, she, she listed all these traits that would identify a woman as being feeble-minded, and one of them was actively seeking sex, another was drinking, being obstinate, being, um, being uh, boisterous. There were so many things. I actually read it to my husband, and he said, so basically you when I met you, and it was, it was everyone, me and all my friends in college, it was a different time. I always identified the 1920s. It was always one of my favorite eras. I thought of it as a time of decadence, of a loosening of sexual kind of more morality and, um, you know, kind of I Zelda Fitzgerald and flappers. And, you know, it was that for rich people. If you were a rich woman in the 1920s, you could have lovers, you could be gay, you could uh, uh, do any number, you could drink and speak easy, and you were considered wonderfully fun and eccentric. If you were a poor woman engaging in the exact same activities, you were considered a menace to society. I think we can move to the next slide. Okay, and this is a great, probably, I think this might be where I should bring in Alex. So this is what I found in my research. I found, of course, that there were these institutions for feeble-minded women, feeble-minded children all over the country. And, um, you know, in, in, they later became, they had different names. They, they might, there might be one in your community. 
you, you might have a place in your community that it, you know was a place for either people who had mental illness or uh, intellectual disabilities. And if you get close up, you might even see a plaque that says feeble-minded on it because at one time that's what they were called. <laughs> um, Alex knows there, I found on eBay like, all these postcards of, this wouldn't be an example of the more attractive ones, but there were color postcards that were really quite beautiful because some of these places did look nice on the outside and there was a reason for that it was they wanted you know the public to continue to you know really embrace you know the the need for these places these places to warehouse these people but um i just thought it was interesting that uh they had postcards i think this was one but it wouldn't be one of the more attractive ones but uh alex is uh you know a, is writing a book about walter e fernald i knew about him because the fernald school was also uh at one time a eugenics asylum during the uh, eugenics era, which was the early 20th century. It wasn't started, it's, it was an older uh, asylum, so it started with a different thing. I wanna also just say, I read many, many books, I did a lot of research, but if you wanna watch something that really distills the whole eugenics uh, kind of uh, philosophy and the whole uh, era and the, the what uh, crusade, uh, PBS did a special call, uh, well, you know, on their show, American Experience, they did an episode called The Eugenics Crusade. You can screen, you can stream it. It really tells uh, much better than I can, in a, you know, and with lots of photographs, how, how popular and widespread it was, how much, how everybody loved it until it, um, it, it came to a, a screeching halt. Uh, with World War II. What happened, uh, many probably know, the final solution of eugenics it, uh, what was the Holocaust. Um, Hitler wrote uh, in Mein Kampf about the, his admiration for American eugenics uh, scientists. And he started with uh, forced sterilization and then ended up with the Holocaust. And that is when Great Britain and the United States and these other countries suddenly, uh, you know, eugenics was not talked about. And that's why I believe we don't, many of us who don't, you know, we just, it, it was a very popular, very short lived uh, pseudoscience. However, many, much of our society is still uh, suffering from the fallout of that. Um, and, it, uh, and, and the stuff I learned and was reading about during my research is our having to do with immigration, our, uh, z xenophobia, racism, of course, and women's right to their, the, their bodily autonomy, their uh, reproductive you know, choices. Uh, it was very much a part of this story and laws enacted, eugenics laws, such as the Immigration Act of 1924, which very much had to do with uh, race. Uh, they, our country is still, uh, you know, uh, we're still, we're still suffering from, from what happened then. I, I, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna. If, is there another slide, or should I just bring in Alex? I'm not. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is okay. Alex, do you want to talk? Or should I? Can I bring Alex in now? I've never done a live event, guys. So I'm sorry. Um, I'm here. I can okay, good. Hey, this is Alex Green. Uh, Hi, folks. Um, so nice to be with you today. Thank you so much, Ann, um, uh, uh, for bringing me in. And I, I, I did just briefly interrupt things to say, um, uh, American Ancestors, I know you're all here because you have some connection with this organization, but being based here in Cambridge, um, it's, it's such a foundational organization for research such, such as mine, and I imagine all of yours. Um, and and um, it just makes it such a pleasure to be here today and, and um, as a former bookseller to see Porter Square Books selling books, which is awesome, but most of all to be with you, Anne, because the book is really so spectacular. And um, we don't talk about these things. Um, there's just not much out there on these things. Um, and uh, so, so if you'll forgive us in the audience, we'll, we'll incorporate some of your questions as we go through the, the rest of the hour. 
um, uh, at the same time that we geek out over the fact that we're we're two people who have immersed ourselves in this stuff, and there's very few of us who have, and have thus been uh, 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 trading these images and photographs and postcards that were generated out of all of these places. And what this is, is an interior shot from um, what later came to be known as the Walter E. Fernald State School, but at the time was the uh, Massachusetts State School for the Feeble-Minded. It's the oldest institution in the Western Hemisphere for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and Walter Fernald, their superintendent, was a leading figure um, in shaping almost all of how we think about disability today from special education um, onward. Um, and and um, so this is an interior shot of a workroom where women were, were um, taught basic skills. You can kind of see loom material in the back. And this was meant to be a source of um, uh, showing off how good the institution was inside. Um, uh, but I, I think obviously looking at people's faces, you can you can glean quite a bit about about what you're seeing, right, Anne? Minute. Yeah, and I I also thought um, I know there's people who in the audience uh, are very very uh, active genealogists and historians and love to date photographs. I tried, and if anybody wants, maybe in the comments on the YouTube video, you can say when you think this photograph was taken. I, Alex, what do you think? Uh, my ballpark guess is somewhere between 1905 and 1915, um, yeah. uh, but but I'm I'm willing to be wrong on that. <laughs> so, right. Um, uh, I'm sure there are like dead giveaway details in here that, that folks who know fashion um, or who know the equipment and it will know right off the bat. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Yeah. So this is what, so they would be doing loom, they're, they're, weave, they're weaving, is it looms they're, they're working with? Yeah, they're making rugs, you know, and, and, right. and uh, part of this was to sell, to sustain the institutions. Part of it um, was, was the mission of teaching people basic skills, but they also were very sensitive about the idea and some were for use, but they were very sensitive of the idea that ba basically these institutions made anything that unions would not fight them on making. So, so unions would show up and say, look, you can't produce things that will cut into our work or our union. Um, and so that heavily limited from a very early era onward what they would make um, for things that were not used for internal institutional use and that, that they could sell. So. Interesting. I didn't know that. Um, I wanted to add that these um, women who worked in the well, the, the a place where my grandmother worked, um, there were I was I was blown away by how few paid employees there were. It was a very large asylum in those days. Farms supported the asylums, and in those days, too, asylums were considered consider their success was based on how self sustain support sustaining they were how little they cost the taxpayers and Laurelton State Village was run by a female psychiatrist a very dynamic woman who I was quite uh, quite inspired by and who became a main character in my book she was a she earned her medical degree in 1899 and was you know very a very important doctor bef before she could vote um but anyway she had uh her place was so successful because she had the quote unquote feeble minded woman doing everything from clearing forest, you know, uh, working these fields, crop fields, working in the dairy and making all of the clothing for the uh, work, the many uh, inmates, as they called them, uh, all the cooking and cleaning, baking, everything. So they were quite adept the people who ran these places and uh, promoted them they were quite adept at making a, a, something like this look like a very like oh look they're learning a craft but they and i see a lot of rugs back there <laughs> so they were also probably making money and um you know so these these the again as i said earlier they would farm out girls to work the, uh, any money the asylum could make off of the inmates proved the success of the asylum to the community, to the taxpayers, to politicians that they needed to support the asylum. Sorry. Go ahead, Alex. No, I think it's, it's spot on. And it, it um, uh, I, I'm grateful to the folks in the Q&A who have already pinpointed that the, the uh, previous uh, uh, image was people making lace bobbin uh, pillows, which is okay. absolutely amazing. So thank yeah, you I knew all it. audience I knew they for, would know. For, um, for knowing that inside now, Geraldine and, and Deborah, thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, 
Yeah. Now, what are they making? Oh, they're making rugs. We know that. And then I think, yeah, I know there'll be people in the audience who will know just from their hair and what they're wearing when that was. Okay, is this more of the lace bobbin pill pillows then, maybe? Maybe, yeah. Um, I think, again, I'm always just drawn in by people's faces. Um, yeah. You, you can see so much there. And I, I think so much of that comes through in the novel, um, uh, just to really spend a while looking at these women and not moving along. Um, it's very sad, right? So our urge is to look away and to pull away. Um, I spend a long time with with that aspect of these photos. Um, well, what strikes me, look how young. I mean, look how young they are. And they don't, you know, they're not, um, you know, they're not being taught to, you know, life skills as as they would later, probably at the Fernal School or at other places. They weren't being prepared to perhaps move out of the place. They were simply just warehouse there. So it's just sad. I found it very tragic going through the census records of every decade seeing the same names, but they were 10 years older. Yeah, and I think that, you know, maybe that that's where we can incorporate some of the questions from the audience, because I've seen a lot of questions about um, these sorts of these sorts of things, and I think they're really perceptive. I, um, uh, Victoria had asked this really great question. I think Carla had something similar. Victoria asked about um, uh, if you accessed any physician's notes, you mentioned that pamphlet before that you had accessed. Um, uh, and then Carla asked, you know, who holds these records in states? I, this is a journey to get to the point where you talk about these things so easily, but you've gone through a decade of records. And um, I, I just to step back with those two questions, what are the records? What kind of records did you find about a place like this that actually help you shape a story, understand your grandmother better, and also write this novel? Well, I would love for you to speak to this too, because you actually, I know, are an advocate for people who are trying to find records of their relatives who were uh, confined. Sadly, I couldn't find I I couldn't find my my, my grandmother's orphanage. I I don't know if I ever will. Um, I did find in the state archives very limited information. Um, I did learn uh, from a person who worked there it, right before it closed that the, she, these, her word was purge. The, the, the employees were encouraged to purge um, documents that, and the employees, some of them kept them and they exist. And I, and I, I, I don't mean like personal information about patients, but about actually uh, the institution. What I found fascinating was she, was that she, <laughs> if she's watching, forgive me. I'm not sure. I, actually, I think it's fine. Why is it a secret? I feel that part of what, what it is, it's so, we want to, it's almost like a, a, a family that's dysfunctional. Our country, like, why are we not saying it out loud? She has a log book of uh, delegates from foreign countries who came to this <laughs> asylum, which was considered a model, uh, a, a, a very, uh, you know, a model program for how to how to deal with the problem of feeble minded people in the community and how to keep them from having feeble more. Uh, it was a eugenics asylum. It was a model asylum. She has um, a logbook. And I asked her, you know, what kind, was it Germany, Europe? And she said, oh, yeah. And she said specifically, I I, she, I think she said Japan, um, but uh, I think Japan had a kind of a, a their own thing. So I am so glad she saved that. I hope it does end up in a historical society someplace. It's funny uh, through through face, a Facebook group. I've talked to people. We've there's there's been this like um, concern about protecting um, the people. You know, the people who work there don't want the place to be stigmatized, but. I know that people come to these sites and say, oh, I didn't know my great aunt was feeble-minded. No one told me she was intellectually disabled. And I feel it's unfair to get to not give them the context that they might very well have. In fact, they probably were not. They're only a small percentage, it seems, were, were, were what they would call, I'm not even, I don't even want to say it, but, but the lowest percentage of intellectually disabled. It was often referred to, referred to in the newspaper as a, a delinquent home. So it's just, I, I feel it's unfair. They were stigmatized in life and now they're being stigmatized from beyond the grave because people don't want to say what it really was. Alex, you share with us what you uh, have been working on with helping people find their parents. and their. Well, it's, it's very similar to what you're describing. I mean, Massachusetts has among the most restrictive records laws in the United States, we don't have what are called sunset clauses on our records. And so even if you had a relative in an institution 200 years ago, and they're, they're 
well, most, yeah, um, uh, were here, you know, you, you can't access those records. You're not allowed to, um, things are redacted. It moves very slowly. Um, uh, and really the cumulative effect is that people can't know about their ancestors. They can't know if there are congenital mental health conditions that run in their families. They can't identify where people came from or where they went to. And the, probably the largest thing you're saying, you know, where you say beyond the grave is, is all of these institutions. And there were 350 or more across the country at its peak warehousing quarter million people in the United States um, had institutional cemeteries where people were buried, usually what we call nameless graves. They have a number or a letter on them. But basically, um, uh, the goal was to spare the shame of the living, right? Um, that you would be associated with someone who had been in an institution. Well, now those are all over the, the state in Massachusetts. And what I've been working with students on is uncovering those names from keepers of records who have held on to them, knowing that the state is very restrictive. Um, and at the same time, pushing the state to put in provision a sunset clause at 90 years, which is the urgent legislation that we're all kind of pushing for here. Um, uh, because otherwise you, you can't access these things, which seems um, to just reinforce the stigma of not talking about them, right? It's exactly what you're, you're saying. And I, th I think the characteristics of the institution you're describing in the book are really unique, right? It's it's um, they they nail what why this 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 history always stays silent. It was its own village, basically. It was out in the middle of nowhere, um, and in that, the superintendent could be a kind of dominant figure, right? And really, almost like a not even a mayor, but a dictator, almost the whole place, right? Um, yes. Very much so, and she was, so the main character of the book is, is based on my grandma, but she works with a very dynamic and very charismatic woman who was based on a, a real doctor who ran the real place where my grandmother worked. And I wanted the reader to come into the novel um, with kind of like follow Mary's journey of discovery. And first of all, she, like I, when I first started researching it, I was blown away by the real doctor who ran the asylum. Her name was Dr. Mary Wolf again. She went to medical school when few women went to college. And I was also very like astounded by the limitations, you know, she had as a woman, even though she was, you know, so well educated. If she had been married, even though she was a doctor, she would have had the legal status of a child. Her husband would have been her guardian. She was writing a uh, public health uh, dossier is not the word I know, Alex. You probably know. Um, she was writing stuff for elected officials to help them shape policy about mental health or you know public health yet she couldn't vote them in last night i just want to say i was at politics and prose and massachusetts own senator ed markey came to my event and he wanted to tell me about a place called the walter fernald school uh and i just was blown away and told him about alex and um he, so he had done some he and uh the late senator ted kennedy had um had done some work to help uh, victims of, uh, Alex knows more about this, but he, I, thank you, Senator Markey for taking, for coming and being interested in this issue and in the book. There's a generation of these, of these people who are getting older and there's a real fear that we will lose these stories who fought very, very hard for major reforms. Um, uh, uh, and Markey was 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 at the forefront of this. Senator Kennedy and his entire family were at the forefront of this, right? Very, very influential. Um, uh, disability rights has brought together um, groups of people who may disagree about other issues a lot, um, uh, but, th but there are different religious traditions and reasons why people will kind of gather around disability rights. Um, uh, I, I, there's, there's a, ter, you know, terrific related question that Rose asked, um, uh, sent in advance, and please feel free to send uh, questions into the Q and A folks as well. But um, she, she asked, were young women sometimes labeled as prostitutes if they had a child out of wedlock? And she said, I'm wondering because I saw this notation for a woman who died after giving birth to an illegitimate baby in 1880. And I wonder if you can speak to those notions of legitimacy and illegitimacy, because it's, it's very confusing. The, women are in every facet of this story, right? It, it, yeah. is, it, is, it, it is simultaneously about the oppression of women and led by women. Help us understand how you think that through writing all of these characters into a story and, and this notion of prostitution and children out of wedlock. I don't know if it would necessarily, a woman might be 
considered a prostitute, but I did, I was surprised to look at, um, uh, uh, you know, it was a, a list, I think it was in a newspaper of people had, who had been arrested in the past, you know, month or so and their crimes. And so there, it was against, you could be arrested for uh, adultery and then you could be arrested for, and I, I only found women who were arrested for this, for fornication. And, or, and you could be arrested for prostitution. So that made me believe that it was against the law. You know, so if, if fornication isn't prostitution, so it's against the law, I guess, to have that. Fornication must have meant sex outside of marriage. I guess you could be arrested for that. I know women were institutionalized for that. Um, again, uh, you know, a lot of people have vilified Margaret Stanger in recent years when they found out she was a eugenicist. Our, our society really needs to have people be very good or very bad. They can't, they don't, they have a hard time putting people in the context of their time. Margaret Sanger did wonderful things for women. We, you know, she, she, and she rolled up her sleeves and worked really hard. She went into the tenements. She saw the poverty and the sickness and, and the lack of knowledge and awareness of how to prevent uh, pregnancies. She also knew that women who middle class and upper class women had less children because they had simply just education. They knew how biology works. They would use the rhythm method. And she just, so I, we have to say, I just want to pause to say, you know, there was that, that was, um, I don't even know why I went to Margaret saying it, but, but um, she also was though, unfortunately, a uh, very outspoken eugenicist. She did write in, in her book in 1924 that all women of the feeble-minded class must be segregated because they will certainly be bare children of the idiot and imbecile type. So, um, you know, unfortunately uh, there, you know, this is the, 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 some, you know, I, our country, we loved her, we hate her. I, she was of her time. I but I, I think that there's an anonymous anonymous post question here about have we found that the mere if you found the mere mention of the word eugenics for this research prompts attacks on your motivations. It seems that now people are so obsessed with revisionist history, such that historical reality becomes something incredibly and sadly a foreign concept. Um, and I, you know, I, 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 I think this, this, this is maybe something where fiction is a space where we can do this this better is holding these two ideas at once in our mind. So much of this story seems to be a, le a lesson about what it means to say, I want to help people. And that that is both, you know, as a moral fable goes, something incredibly dangerous to try to do and right. also something with incredible promise, right? I think that is such a smart question or a comment that somebody just, that you just um, shared. I had so much pushback early on with uh, the early reads of this novel. And it, it, you know, some of them were, you know, right. The, it was very long at first, but really people had a hard time with the protagonist uh buying into because they didn't have they lacked as you know as i did too when i first they didn't have the historical context that this was the law of the land so why so people really also it seems now um it's very much in fiction that the protagonist has to especially you know has to be kind of a white savior kind of thing where they have to the other people can be you know can be bigoted and and um you know have have flaw, you know, terrible flaws but the main character should try to save you know everybody so anyway i really stood firm no i wanted her to be who she was a, who you know a person who lacked agency herself who would never question uh an institution that was embraced the the um you know the governor of Pennsylvania, his wife was on the board. She stayed at the superintendent's house. They were best friends. They went to college together. I mean, it was why would she question that? You know, everybody who and you know, it was, it was this this doctor went around Pennsylvania and gave talks to garden clubs and political groups. Why would a seven my why would my 18-year-old grandmother who had a ninth grade education and got vocational training as secretary, why would she? You know, that, that you know, especially young people today want her to be a revolutionary and bring it. No, I, I wanted it. I wanted it to be more authentic and, and not anachronistic. And also I wanted to see if people can accept, you know, I think it's 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 on us to represent, you know, who we were at that time. I think uh, even if we were perfect. 
we see it much more with the more recent history of these places too. You mentioned the former employees. And I think, I think a lot of people went into these places and didn't know what they were getting into. Um, and some of them did really revolutionary and beautiful things and other people did really awful things and awful things were done to the people who went and worked in them, right? These are yeah. places of such enormous size. I mean, how many people were, were at Laurelton at its, at its height? Oh. Oh my God, thousands. But when my grandmother was there, there were 600, but there were like 25 employees or something. So she, um, yeah, so yeah, it was, um, and I will say again, it was a very beautiful campus. And so, um, you know, I, anyway, my grandmother, according to my mother, never spoke of working there. She met my grand, it, the, this asylum is about a half an hour from Bucknell University, and my grandfather was at Bucknell. He met her, she was driving a fancy car that I assume belonged to the, the doctor she worked for, and he thought she was cute, and he, she, she told him she worked for the government, and my mother always knew she worked for the government. She did work for the government. She worked for a government eugenics asylum, uh, but my mother said she never told her what that she worked in any, any asylum, but especially this asylum. And I think, I know she wasn't ashamed at the time because in their marriage announcement, it said that she worked at the Laurelton State Village and it wasn't, but I think after the war, um, you know, A, the asylum changed, there were reforms. I mean, it, there was brut brutal cruelty at this place, brutal, and it's in, in, the, in the novel. Um, so, it, the, the, you know, and, and then as you know, Alex, at most, institutions they didn't really know how to deal with people before medication anyway um so but she never she she never spoke of it i think it i think people stopped talking about these places because they it suddenly eugenics people understood it better and it wasn't something you were proud of being involved in and i to that end i mean it is such a total place and ruth asked this great question did anybody as attempt escape and and oh yes and were there successful escapes from laurelton that you know of um there probably were, uh, but the news, the local newspaper would report on, um, I saw many escapes, many escapes, six or eight girls at a time, um, the, over the, you know, over the years, but they, some of them were quite really like very cleverly. They would Jimmy a lock and then they'd make it look like it wasn't broken in three days, you know? And so there were a, a couple of papers. And I think this is, there were so many parallels between then and now one is it, the it was very the, our country was very divided politically and there was fake news they had news was very regional so they had the local paper one was i think owned or it was somehow it, it was involved with the the doctor the superintendent's brother was very involved with that newspaper that was the daily then the evening paper was like an enemy of her family's so they had one talked about all the atrocities and the other one talked about how fabulous it was. And so I loved that. I was I said, oh, it's just, you know, here we are. And there were, so, of course, immigration was a huge, there was actually a quote, one of the um, politicians at the time was talking about eugenics and said, if only we could build a wall, build a, like he was, he was being, um, you know, he was making a joke, but he said, if only we could build a huge wall all around the country. I mean, it was so, so it was, it was the immigration, uh, women's bodily autonomy, women's, are we, are women's, are we as human or as adult as men? Uh, we, we, we have to ask that again today, but while this was all going on, I just have to say, um, the book, the book isn't, the Washington Post did this great review that said, you know, it might seem grim, but actually this book is also really like, um, kind of, I, I don't know if she said fun, but anyway, she made it, you know, I, I was glad that she said, it, it's not grim. I've actually, while researching it, compared to my friends, while they were freaking out about what was going on in the country, I kept thinking and saying, it's been worse. It has been worse. Mm -hmm. We've been through this before. We should be better than we are now, but anyway. How, that how have your own view, I mean, is there any, like, large change in your own views from having done this where you can pinpoint and say, God, I, I used to think this way about this thing, but having done this, I now think about it differently from having done all this work. Oh my God. In so many ways. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, I honestly, I think the thing I didn't understand, uh, I guess I didn't understand how very, very vulnerable women, especially women like my grandmother who were poor, and um, especially who didn't have a family, uh, you know, husbands could be, uh, you know, they they were very, you, they, they would protect you or they could, if they did, wanted to, they could have you 
put set in a sign. Not only that, um, your adult son could. Men, women really were not um, uh, until the mid twentieth century didn't have the same rights. So I guess I didn't I didn't fully appreciate. And that helped me a little bit understand. I, I really did. I was very angry at Margaret Sanger. And I, when I saw that she was actually very famous and giving speeches at Vassar and trying to help educate you know, poor women about how not to have children, she too couldn't vote. Her husband was her guardian. She was considered the child legally. She couldn't have a bank account. All of this, and it helped inform the doctor in my novel. I didn't want her to be a one-dimensional villain. I wanted to show what made her the way she is. I wanted to show what made marry the main character the way she was and that was that she was alone in the world she had never been no one ever loved her and so all these things that i i learned um i help i hope helped make my characters because as a writer that's the most important thing to me is to make my characters uh very uh believable fully realized and almost you know alive to the reader mm -hmm. I we have just a few minutes left, and I I understand you're going to uh, uh, wind down with with a short reading from the book. But um, you know the joy of doing fiction is that you you do get to make up a story as well within this. Um, uh, you know, with nonfiction, you have to follow all the rules and you have to be factually correct. Um, where did you break history with this? Like there have to be moments where your story collides headlong into, into reality and you have to make a choice about what you're going to break down. What'd you do? Where? Right. Well, where, I mean, the there's a whole plot that of course didn't exist. It's like, you know, and there's a romance. I mean, there's a, there, there, the, the whole plot really is fiction, but the things about the place that, you know, the asylum itself, I don't think I invented anything, but I will say my grandmother, I don't know when, I think she started working there in 1930. She worked there till at least 32. I decided to have her work there in 1927 simply because I didn't want the, like the depression. I didn't want the like economic collapse in our country because that, that was also, it was just too much. It was like then, mm -hmm. and what I was learning, what happened at the asylum because of that, you know, there was a lot there, but I thought, you know, so I just made that, like, I just inched it a couple years earlier because I did, I did want to have it. Uh, uh, it was the same place a few years earlier. Um, but I will say it, it actually, for me personally, you know, made me realize how lucky my grandmother was to work there. She, you, you, some of the only job, the best jobs you could have were working for the government at that time. So she was very, very lucky. I, I say that because I still have people say um, they're angry at the narrator of the book, you know, at my character for working there. She, you know, wh why would she be so awful? And that's just shows a lack of understanding of the time. That's right. That's right. Um, there was a, a question in the chat was the McLean's Asylum, which is one of the oldest, maybe the oldest private asylum in the United States. Well, no, no, one of. Um, uh, was it a eugenics institution? And I'll, I'll just briefly address that question saying that that I think that, that be, because of the way eugenics grafted onto institutions as an ideology, it became, and I think the rights movements of the 70s and 80s proved that it's very, it became inseparable from institutionalization. Those ideas are very hard to put back in the box once they're out. And I think we tried to make institutions better. And I think we ran very hard headlong into the question of whether or not it's actually possible to get past eugenic ideals. And in that way, I would say that McLean fell into very similar traps, um, uh, very, very similar traps. Um, uh, a last question for you, Anne, as, as we wind down, um, what do you want us to come away from this book? Uh, thinking, knowing, feeling. I love this idea of a protagonist who, who we, we love sometimes and we hate sometimes. And, and the book is so propulsive. Um, uh, uh, and and I, I just see a quick note here that if there are remaining questions, they will come to me. We will find a way to answer them. Um, um, they'll come to Anne, but I, what, what should we walk with this? What's your dream? You put down the book and you say, man, I, this, what is it? Well, I think that um, there, there were people who, again, not, no, not really knowing how it, it was people who wanted Mary, the main character to like kind of destroy the eugenic, you know, bring down the whole place. And, um, you know, it was almost like, asking why didn't Schindler end the Holocaust? It was that this thing of like, the, you know, so I actually hope people will see, there was a struggle with Mary, whether she should, you know, whether she really bought into the system, whether she should help her friend. That was, you know, her friend who she grew up with was an inmate. And in, ultimately I don't want to spoil the plot, but I hope people come away with it with an understanding that 
We might feel overwhelmed with what's going on in our country, in the world today. We, well, none of us, none of us, I don't know, uh, can really cha change it, it, large uh, things that are going on in our society. But my uh, main character tried to find a way to change, to help in a small, help, you know, a, a, in a small way, you know, one or a few people. And I want people to think about like that, how we can in our own lives, just make one person, you know, who is if one victim, less of a victim. And also to see, to look, another part of Mary's journey is, is to be honest you know, about herself, is to look at ourselves and look at who we really are and why we believe the way we do about ourselves and about others and why we are sometimes afraid of others because they're not like us. I, I will say, and, and Margaret will come back in in a moment, but I will say that um, you mentioned before how difficult it is to tell these stories. I do not take for granted the existence of this book, the simple fact of its existence. This is not a historical point. It's a present day point linked to history. We still do not talk about these things. We still are uncomfortable talking about these things. We still don't want to look them in the face. And if the small acts that you're describing, if one of those is having fought like hell to get this story out this way. I, I am very, very, very grateful to you for it. Um, and what, what a pleasure to be with you, Ms. Bauer. That's right. Thank we you. are so grateful to both of you for your dialogue um, today on this topic. It has clearly struck a chord um, with those who are listening, uh, many of you asking about the 60s and the 70s, um, relatives of various immigrant groups, how were they, uh, how were they discriminated against? Um, it's clearly struck a chord across many generations. Um, and we, you know, all I can say is maybe we'll have to get Alex and Anne back for another nope. Anytime. I, um, could, I could talk about this all day. It's like, I'm fascinated. They have to do Bye. that. Uh, we have it in the works, but for now, um, we would really like to hear, as we do for all of our American Inspiration Author events, we love hearing from the author in their own words. So, Anne, if you could read for us um, a section to okay. close it out, that would be great. Thank you. All right. I haven't, I don't usually read it by events. So I just chose this um, just to give it, it's in the second chapter and it's just Mary who was raised in an orphan asylum is, is, is on her way to the, the, uh, to the village, the Lord's and Safe Village with the doctor uh, who has hired her. And so this, so, you know, they're in the car on the way there. Uh, the doctor, the doctor opened her magazine again I gazed out my window. The day was almost over. The roadside farms had disappeared, replaced by walls of dense forest. And for at least half an hour, we hadn't passed a single dwelling. Charlie, the driver, finally slowed the automobile. Then he turned off the main road and onto a narrower lane where he came to a stop. Ahead was an immense wrought iron gate that blocked the drive. Next to the gate was a stone gatehouse. A short, stocky older man jumped out, waved at us and limped over to the gate. He unlocked a large padlock that fastened the gate to a post with a thick chain. And then he pushed the gate to the side so that we could drive through. As, as we passed, Charlie leaned out his window and said, see you in a few pop. The man nodded and smiled vacantly, squinting to see who was in the back seat with Dr. Vogel. I resisted the impulse to wave like a child. As we rolled past, I saw that the road ahead was bordered on each side by dense forest. I turned and saw the man swinging the gate back across the road. It met the post with the resounding clang of iron against iron. I was seized with a, then with a sick feeling. It was the same sick longing I felt when I left St. Catherine's Orphan Asylum with my father years before. A gate had closed behind me that day as well. I'd been excited to leave the orphanage, but my joy had evaporated the minute we pulled out of the driveway. I kept turning around and waving, but Dorothy, Marge, and the others had gone back to the courtyard. In an hour, the dinner bell would ring and they'd be sitting at the long dining tables without me. I realized then that I was in a motor car with a stranger, my own father. All my friends, the sisters and mother Beatrice, would have prayer would have prayers at six supper at 6 15 followed by evening studies washroom visits final prayers and bedtimes were all at set times that were as reliable and familiar as my own pulse but where would I be at those times I felt that afternoon with my father again and again with Dr. Vogel, like I had been carelessly forgotten by the world I felt like a balloon that had been allowed to fly away but now longed for the familiar pull of gravity. I think that's all where I'll stop.
<laughs> that, thank you, Anne. That what a beautiful and atmospheric and truly haunting reading. Um, there are so many levels of institutions that you've addressed in this wonderful novel, um, from orphanages to uh, you know, to Middleton. It's just it's remarkable. I really I loved the pace of it. I loved all the twists and turns, um, as well as the look into history. It was such a pleasure to read. Thank so you so thank much. Thank you so much. And I want to remind folks in the audience, just a reminder, um, copies of The Foundling can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge. Uh, use the code AMINT22 as you order and the book you receive will be signed um, by Anne on a book plate. Uh, thank you for thinking to support authors and researchers and advocates like Alex and independent bookstores um, through your purchase and by extension this series and the team at American Ancestors NEHGS. We are truly delighted to have presented today's event. Uh, I learned so much and we hope to host you all again out there. If you're researching a family, an individual or a time in American history, you might find our library and research center very useful. The stacks on Newbury Street in Boston's Back Bay are now open to the public. NEHGS members can delve into our digital archives anytime, gaining access to 1.4 billion searchable family records. Free to the public, you can chat with one of our genealogists, our Brew Family Learning Center hosts many great educational programs. Whether you're new to researching or an old pro, you will learn something from our programs. Featured here are two in-person education events in July, a one-day refresh in Chicago, and two days in Boston learning from experts. Summer is a great time to be at work on personal research and writing projects. Um, we hope you'll join us. And for the literary among you, we invite you to zoom in again to our virtual author talks. In a free program on June 20, the Pulitzer Prize winning Harvard historian Annette Gordon-Reed will talk about the national holiday Juneteenth, the history behind it and her own family in Texas. She'll be in dialogue with Dartmouth professor Lisa Baldez. The event is presented in partnership with the Boston Public Library and the State Library of Massachusetts. On July 7 at 1 p.m., because one of our authors is a Brit, uh, we'll gain insight into women in the Gilded Age from two authors. Laura Thompson from the UK will discuss her new book, Heiresses, The Lives of the Million Dollar Babies. Betsy Perlow, who is stateside, will paint a portrait of a woman equal in stature to the Rockefellers and to the Carnegies, Mrs. Frank Leslie, the publishing magnet. She'll be drawing from her new book, Diamonds and Deadlines. And as a icing on the cake, they'll be joined by moderator Esther Crane, who's an author and expert on Gilded Age New York. She created the best loving website and blog, Ephemeral New York, which I'm having such fun clicking around on. Don't miss hearing from these women about this remarkable time. And then on July 14th, we welcome Bill Griffith with his new work, which picks up where his remarkable book, first book left off, The Stranger in My Jeans. In that book, he revealed the DNA discovery that rocked his world. Now the retired CNBC anchor will look even harder at the concepts of identity and family and how DNA testing has forced us to rethink the meaning of these words. He'll be in conversation with a NEHGS favorite, journalist and author Libby Copeland, a former American inspiration author, presentee. Um, okay, so back to this evening. Uh, back to today, our mission at NEHGS is to educate, inspire, and connect. We hope we've accomplished this today and that you'll come back for more programs, particularly if we get Ann and Alex back. And Ann and Alex, thank you so much. We are very grateful. We learned so much. And to our audience from all of us behind the scenes in Boston and across the Mid-Atlantic, Pennsylvania, where Ann is, we wish you a glorious June. We thank you for joining us and have a very, very good day. Thank you both so much, Ann and Alex. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Porter Square Books. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you for <laughs>